The amphetamines are commonly called pep pills because of their capacity to stimulate the central nervous system. The barbiturates are depressants and are used as tranquilizers and sleeping pills. To safely facilitate the distribution of these drugs for the medical profession, they are put out in 12 different colors. Let's take a look at the amphetamines or pep pills first. The ingredients in these pills or capsules are usually benzedrine or dexedrine. They generally appear as white tablets which are scored on one side to facilitate breaking, or they may be a heart-shaped tablet with a salmon or sand color. When these pills are taken under the direction of a doctor, the prognosis of the patient is already known, and the right amount can be prescribed. However, in the hands of a layman, an overdose of these pills will produce extreme nervousness, marked insomnia, or inability to sleep, and in some cases, highly disturbing hallucinations. Now let us consider the tranquilizers and sleeping pills. These are the barbiturates, which have an opposite effect from the amphetamines. Those most commonly used are known as nembutol, secanol, phenobarbital, amatol, barbital, and iprol. Of course, their medical use is to help the patient relax and to induce sleep. What many people do not realize, however, is the fact that these drugs are addictive, habit-forming, so that the system can become critically dependent upon them. A person suffering from barbiturate addiction may be easily mistaken for a drunk. Here are the symptoms. Slow, confused thinking, slurred speech, illogical and defective reasoning, obvious emotional disturbances, lack of coordination in walking and driving, tremors in the hands, oscillation of the eyes and inability to hold them in a fixed position. As the toxic effect of barbiturates takes hold, the brain approaches semi-consciousness. In this condition, a person may inadvertently consume an additional quantity of the pills without knowing it. Such cases are sometimes mistaken for suicide attempts when no such intention actually existed. More people die each year from lethal doses of barbiturates than from any other kind of poison. It can be an extremely dangerous drug. Now what happens if a person deliberately or accidentally consumes a heavy dose of pep pills and sleeping pills at the same time? Drug addicts call this a speedball. Three things happen under these conditions. First, the pep pills stimulate the central nervous system. Secondly, the barbiturates try to tranquilize the nervous system. Thirdly, the natural defenses of the body try to resist both chemicals in order to remain normal. All of this can result in the creation of a human zombie whose behavior may be completely erratic for several hours. The Los Angeles Police Department discovered that after individuals have more or less fooled around with the abuse of medical drugs, they tend to develop a curiosity to experiment with something a little more daring. Once again, it is not a professional pusher who usually gets a person to try something new, but the closest associates and friends. This next step is nearly always in the direction of the hallucination drugs. The most popular ones at the moment are LSD and marijuana. We have already discussed the effects of the more powerful LSD, so let us look briefly at marijuana. Marijuana is one of the oldest psychedelic plants in the world. It originated in China, but was later cultivated in India and became known as Indian hemp. The plant has a male and female species. The narcotic resin is particularly abundant in the female plant. Marijuana is processed by taking the flowering tops and leaves of both the male and female plants and then drying them by indirect heat. After the seeds and stems are removed, the dry fibers tend to crumble and resemble catnip or tea, hence the nickname for marijuana. Although there are several ways of using marijuana, the most popular method in the United States is smoking it. The marijuana cigarette is shorter and thinner than the commercial variety, and the ends are crimped and tucked in to prevent the contents from spilling out. Because these cigarettes pass through many hands as they are sold and traded back and forth, they are usually wrapped in double tissues of white or brown cigarette paper so as to stand the wear and tear. The effect produced by marijuana is that of excitement, sometimes hallucinations. However, increased indulgence will produce drowsiness and unconsciousness, so it is technically classified as a sedative. The pupil of the eye of the marijuana smoker becomes extremely dilated, and the white portion of the eye becomes bloodshot. 
In this condition, the pupil of the eye will not react normally to light, and the user will squint or completely close his eyes as though he were looking at the headlights of an approaching car. This is why the marijuana smoker often resorts to dark glasses and wears them even at night. This does not suggest, however, that everybody who happens to be wearing dark glasses is suffering from the toxic effect of marijuana. As with LSD, marijuana impairs time and depth perception. A curb may look like a deep canyon or cliff, but when the user is standing on a real cliff, he will swear that the bottom of the canyon is only a step away. Marijuana also destroys the normal inhibitions of the user, resulting in sexual promiscuity or criminal acts of violence. This has been cited as one of the reasons why so many of the most vicious sex crimes are perpetrated by marijuana users. Crimes of robbery, burglary, and homicide are also common in these cases and the police found that individuals are usually under the influence of marijuana uh, when a person tries his first injection of heroin. Marijuana exaggerates whatever mood a person may be in, its strength and influence. He conceives of himself as a talented artist or an enchanting lover. He may also appear to be content or easygoing, even hysterically laughing, but he can immediately fly into a violent rage at the slightest provocation. Because of this unpredictable effect of behavior, police officers consider a person under the influence of marijuana to be dangerous. Continuous use of this drug will deteriorate the brain tissues, bring about a complete state of insanity in some cases, which requires permanent confinement to a mental institution. Here are the more obvious and readily apparent symptoms of a person under the influence of marijuana. First, visible muscular tremors. Second, accelerated pulse and heartbeat. Third, reckless and erratic operation of an automobile. Four, dizziness, resulting in an irregular walk and an unsteady stride. Five, irrational behavior, such as reckless and brazen disregard toward other people. Now the Los Angeles police report indicates that when a youth or adult has become somewhat accustomed to experimenting with LSD and marijuana, there is a very likely possibility that he will try the heavy opiates. This brings him to a disastrous crisis of total drug addiction. Here is the way an 18-year-old boy named Jan from New York City evolved into heavy narcotics. He says, quote, this will sound crazy, but after LSD I felt I didn't exist anymore. I was nothing. I shouldn't be alive. I had no feeling of who I was. That so depressed me I started on junk, heroin. Then I didn't feel anything, unquote. Jan became a hardened addict and soon found that he was committing serious crimes to get the money for his craving of narcotics. Heroin is probably the worst of all the alkaloids that can be manufactured from opium. It is completely impractical for medical purposes. Its manufacture has been outlawed. Heroin has all the bad features of other addictive drugs, plus the fact that it is many times stronger. It is also extremely expensive. Heroin addicts frequently reach the stage where 50 to $75 per day are required to get enough heroin just to feel normal. The cells of the body not only crave the narcotic to feed upon, but they threaten to go into convulsions if the narcotic is delayed or withheld. This is called the withdrawal symptoms, which absolutely terrifies the drug addict. It is this fear of withdrawal as much as the craving for the drug which drives an addict to commit crimes and get the money needed to buy more dope. Here is what withdrawal is like. As the body cells begin signaling for a fix, the addict commences yawning accompanied by profuse sweating and running of the nose and eyes. There is marked dilation of the pupils of the eye and severe hot flashes begin surging through the system followed by an attack of cold chills. The muscles begin to twitch. This is a sign that the system is getting ready to go into withdrawal pains. It is this stage which terrifies the addict. The whole body commences to go into violent cramps. Addicts describe the excruciating pain as shooting from the roots of their hair down to their toenails. There is continuous nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea. Life becomes a torturous nightmare and sleep is impossible. Addicts have been known to remain awake for weeks at a time, resting only in a coma. The pain is so severe during the first several days of withdrawal that the addict will throw himself to the floor, double up in convulsive cramps, and scream for relief. 
Unless one has seen a confirmed addict pass through this torturous experience, it is almost impossible to comprehend. One would imagine that this would permanently cure a person who has been subject to addiction. Unfortunately, it does not. The vast majority of those who have once been hooked on anything as strong as heroin will go back to it eventually, even after they are supposed to be cured. This is the real tragedy of the so-called hippies and the 13 to 15 year old teeny boppers. They think they are just enjoying a temporary binge of drugs, sex, and psychedelic hallucinations when they are actually launching into a pattern which, if continued, is guaranteed to turn them from healthy and wholesome human beings into half-mad creatures of a nightmare existence. When I see some of these young people in the prime of life with their straggly hair, dirty clothes, and sleazy gait, herding together like a cult of uncivilized cave dwellers, I cannot help but wonder what will happen to them further down the trail. I have seen enough of them to know what life can do to them. They may be hippies today, but tomorrow they are junkies, half-educated, broken in health, alumni of a dozen jails, objects of charity, just human derelicts. Many of them think that after their binge they will get rid of their heroin, hallucinations, etc., and get on with life, but it is not that easy. Many of them that think they are just on a temporary binge are more hooked than they really know. Here is a note from a former hippie which has been preserved by Bill Helper of the Long Beach Police Department. The note said, King Heroin is my shepherd, I shall always want. He maketh me to lie down in the gutters. He leadeth me beside troubled waters. He destroyeth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of wickedness for the effort's sake. Yea, I shall walk through the valley of poverty and will fear all evil. For thou, heroin, art with me. Thy needle and capsule try to comfort me. Thou strippest the table of groceries in the presence of my family. Thou robbest my head of reason. My cup of sorrow runneth over. Surely heroin addiction shall stock me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the damned forever. On the back of this note, the author had added a postscript. Here's what it said. Truly this is my psalm. I am a young woman, 20 years of age, but for the past year and a half, I have been wandering down the nightmare alley of the junkies. I want to quit taking dope, and I try, but I can't. Jail didn't cure me, nor did hospitalization help me for long. The doctor told my family it would have been better and indeed kinder if the person who first got me hooked on dope had taken a gun and blown my brains out. I wish to God she had." Unquote. Well, such is the end of the hippie trail, and thousands of our young people are on that trail today. I like to think we can do something about it. I like to think the young people themselves will want to do something about it. The big job is really education. We have to somehow get the story to them in time. Preaching won't do it, but teaching might. I have faith in our young people. I'm raising eight of them myself. Somehow I feel that if we really try, if we really concentrate on this whole narcotics fad, we can get our youth to see the futility of it and the stupidity of it. In conclusion, therefore, may I offer several possible solutions. First, may I suggest that it needs to be recognized and emphasized that the current narcotics fad is very much like a forest fire. It is self-expanding with each inflamed goofballer, psychedelic, and hippie trying to inflame and involve his friends. And like a forest fire, it is self-destroying, leaving in its wake the ugly, burned out, and disfigured fragments of what used to be promising human beings. Secondly, it is time to recognize that this forest fire of narcotic contagion can and should be contained. A bare majority of the President's Crime Commission wanted to remove the stigma of crime from narcotics and treat it like malaria or smallpox. In other words, treat it merely as a medical problem. 
However, a substantial minority of the commission, the ones who seem to have the most professional experience and competence in dealing with the problem, strongly disagreed. They said the medical aspects of the problem are remedial or therapeutic, but not preventive. They said the promoters and participants in the narcotic cults are conspiratorial and are waging a war against decent and orderly society. Therefore, those responsible need to be identified and penalized rather than cuddled and coddled, they said. Laws needed to be stiffened, they said, not softened. Enforcement, particularly by the courts, needed to be far more vigorous, decisive, and prompt. Furthermore, they said new laws needed to be passed facilitating the procedure for the collecting of evidence and convicting of the guilty. We once had such a procedure, but the Supreme Court, with several of its members strongly dissenting, threw it out. The Congress then passed a new law, which was hailed as a fair and restrained approach to the problem, but the President, for some reason, elected to veto it. At the moment, therefore, the legal containment of narcotics is deplorably weak and the minority members of the President's Crime Commission have discovered a serious prevention gap in the narcotics front, which I feel needs immediate repair. Third, there needs to be a widespread educational program designed to give narcotics a cultural taboo. The laws I just mentioned are needed primarily to contain the small rebel element, which prides itself in creating chaos in our society but the majority of the people will respond to an educational and cultural approach. The strength in this approach was demonstrated in England. As long as the English had cultural contempt for narcotics addiction, the problem was amazingly well contained. Even their laws could be permissive so long as the cultural taboo was exceptionally strong. But today there is growing alarm in England because the cultural breakdown has struck there just as it has here. Their permissive laws have also allowed the same prevention gap to develop there as we have developed here. They are therefore considering a much stronger legal defense as well as a new drive to educate the people. And we need that here. Fourth, if we are to develop an effective program of education on narcotics, it must be initiated and maintained on the institutional level where the attitudes and cultural values of our youth are being formed. Initially, this is in the home, but ultimately, it is in the school. As a rule, the elementary and secondary schools have done a fairly effective job, but a devastating breakdown has occurred on the college and university level. Both parents who pay the taxes and students who have come for an education deserve a better climate of order and common sense than has existed on so many campuses where riots, pornography, narcotics, and venal sexuality have been allowed to develop into an established pattern of campus life. I believe parents and students both deserve something better than that. Fifth, it needs to be recognized that the creation of fads in human behavior is exactly like the creation of fads in dresses and bathing suits. People like to be in on the latest thing. Therefore, whatever the newspapers, magazines, radio, and TV start booming as the latest grooviest thing is going to catch on. What I'm trying to say here is that the mass communications media could perform a tremendous public service by developing a code of ethics which says they will not give expensive page space and airtime to stories which will obviously promote a fascinating interest in human depravity and narcotic debauchery. What I'm asking for is not censorship, but an emphasis on honest reality. It makes a tremendous impact on a young mind if narcotics are presented as the latest, grooviest thing, something the smart set is all doing. It would be just as easy to portray the goofballer, acid head, and pot smoker as an archaic form of stupidity, which modern civilization has repudiated as completely as human sacrifices. And finally, let me say just a word about the home. This is always the favorite scapegoat to blame for most of our problems. But the fact remains that the home is indeed the key to a civilization's survival. Therefore, we turn to the home in hoping it will help meet the escalating problem of narcotics. Here are several things for parents to remember. First of all, young people who are practicing a consistent participation in genuine religious activity 
not the God is dead cult, but genuine religious activity, will hardly ever fall for the lure of narcotics. All of our studies prove this. Secondly, young people who have a wholesome group of associates around them with a cultural taboo against narcotics have no difficulty avoiding the current fad. Third, young people and even adults who do get involved in the psychedelic or addiction fad are usually those who are bored with life, who don't have enough challenge, who don't have enough responsibility or enough opportunity to be creatively involved in life. Here are some of the things every home can take decisive action in doing something about right now. Furthermore, young people, also adults who find themselves bored and neutralized toward life, I believe have a responsibility to get with it and not wait for somebody else to coddle, cajole, or cudgel them into becoming happy, creative human beings. So, my message is not one of despair. There is plenty all of us can do about this current problem of psychedelics, hallucinations, and addiction. Certainly the challenge is sufficiently acute to demand the best from each of us.